the projectile motion section of the 2020 physics paper starts with question 1.3 of multiple choice, which reads, the graph below shows how one of the physical quantities associated with an object in free fall changes with time t. The label on the y-axis is omitted. Which one of the following physical quantities can be the label on the y-axis? The key thing to notice in this question is that we are told that this object is in free fall. We know that when it is in free fall that there is only one force acting on it and that is the force of gravity. Since there is only one force acting on it, the acceleration or gravitational acceleration of this object is constant. So the force of gravity acting on this object and the gravitational acceleration are constant. And in our options, the weight force is the only option that we have. So the correct answer is C. Question 1.4 reads, a ball of mass M falling vertically downwards hits the floor at a speed V and bounces vertically upwards at a speed 0.75 V. Which of the following combinations regarding the change in momentum of the ball during the collision is correct? And what's important for us to realize is firstly that the momentum has changed direction. So the initial momentum of this object, which is a result of its speed, is 1v and that is downward. The initial momentum is 1v and then the final momentum is 0.5v, but that is then upward. So what we need to realize is that the change in momentum is an upward direction because the object was initially heading downward and then changed direction upward and it is therefore the combination of both of these which means that the change in momentum is 1.75 times v and then we can clearly see by drawing this uh, vector diagram here we can see that that is an upward change which means that the correct answer is option c where the magnitude of the change is 1.75 v and the direction of the change is upwards. Question three reads, a small ball is dropped from a height of two meters and bounces a few times after landing on a cement floor. Ignore air friction. The position time graph below is not drawn to scale and represents the motion of the ball. Question 3.1, define the term free fall and free fall according to the guideline document is the motion of an object under the influence of gravity only. It is an object that is acted upon only by gravity, but specifically it is the motion of an object. This is not to be confused with a projectile, which is a motion, which is an object that is acted upon only by gravity. Free fall is the motion of an object acted upon only by gravity. And that is question 3.1. Question 3.2 says, use the graph to determine, and then 3.2.1, the time that the ball is in contact with the floor for the first bounce. And so we can see that the ball is dropped from a height of two meters. It then accelerates downwards and strikes the ground at time t 0.64. We then see that from 0.64 seconds until 0.67 seconds, the position of the ball does not change. The cause of this is obviously that the ball is in contact with the ground for the duration of that time, which means that the contact time is the difference between those two times. And so we can say that the time for which it's in contact is equal to 0 0.67 minus 0 0.64, which is then 0 0.03 seconds. Question 3.2.2. The time it takes the ball to reach its maximum height after the first bounce. So that was 3.2.1, 3.2.2. As we can see here, the maximum height after the first bounce is a height of 1.85 meters, which immediately should tell us that we can see that the ball has not reached its initial height, which tells us that some energy was lost during the bounce. And the way that we can solve this is by realizing that the ball at its maximum height has a velocity of zero. We know that when it reaches its maximum height, its velocity uh, 
is temporarily zero. There are a number of ways in which this problem could be solved. The first and possibly the simplest way is to realize that the time that the ball takes to reach its maximum height will be equal to the time that the ball takes to go from its maximum height back to the ground, which allows us to therefore say that the time taken to reach its maximum height is simply half the time that it takes to return to the ground. So we could say the time that it takes to return to the ground is its time at the second bounce, 1.9 seconds, minus its time when it leaves the ground, 0 0.67 seconds, and then simply divide that by two to find that our answer was 0 0.615 or simply 0 0.62. So we could also have solved this by using a relevant equation of motion. Final velocity squared is the initial velocity squared plus two times the acceleration times the displacement. Either way, it doesn't matter. The result or the answer would have been the same and the mark allocation remains the same. Question 3.2.3 asks us to find the speed at which the ball leaves the floor at the first bounce. And so once again, we can do this by realizing that this object at its maximum height has a final velocity of zero. And so what we can do is we can say that our final velocity squared is equal to our initial velocity squared plus two times the acceleration, gravitational acceleration times the displacement of this object, where our final velocity at the maximum height is zero, the initial velocity is our unknown, and gravitational acceleration remains a constant of 9.8, and the displacement here is 1.85. And now what we need to realize is that this ball is traveling upwards, the displacement is upward after the first bounce, the acceleration is downward, and so we need to declare a direction as positive. I prefer to use downward as my positive direction, so therefore I would have positive 9.8 meters per second per second as the acceleration, but then my displacement, which is upward, must be recorded as a negative displacement, and that is negative 1.8 eight five meters per second so that is 1.85 meters and therefore our initial velocity of this object is going to be negative 6.02 and then we always prefer to write that in the positive form 6.02 meters per second and that is upwards this could also have been solved with Another equation of motion, that being Vf is equal to Vi plus G delta T. And because we had in the previous question calculated the amount of time it takes to reach its maximum height, we could therefore calculate its initial velocity. Either way, you would arrive at the same answer. Question 3.2.4 asks us to calculate the time indicated on the graph, the time T indicated on the graph. And so what we can see is since we know at what time the ball left the ground after its second bounce, we know that it reaches a maximum height of 1.2 meters. And at that point, its velocity is zero. And then we also know that this object is going to take equally long to go from, its, from the ground to its maximum height as it will take to go from its maximum height back to the ground. And so this answer is going to involve two calculations. The first calculation is where we calculate the velocity with which this ball leaves the ground. That is the initial velocity, uh, the final velocity squared is equal to the initial velocity squared plus 2g delta x, where I am using downward as my positive direction. The final velocity at its maximum height is zero. The initial velocity is our unknown the acceleration is downward, therefore a positive value, and the displacement is upward, therefore a negative value of 1.2 meters, which tells us that our initial velocity is negative 4.85 meters per second. This makes sense, again, because the object is traveling upward, and therefore the velocity 
is negative. What we can now do is we can calculate the amount of time that it takes the object when it leaves the ground at 4.85 meters per second to reach a velocity of zero and then double that amount of time. We could also realize that when the object returns to that starting point, its velocity will be 4.85 meters per second. We could also do this by realizing that when this object returns, its displacement, delta x or delta y, will be zero. So there are a number of ways in which we can solve this from here. As I said earlier, I would prefer to calculate the amount of time it takes to reach its maximum height. And then I can just double that. And I can do that by saying VF is equal to VI plus G delta T, where the final velocity is zero. The initial velocity is upward, therefore negative 4.85 plus 9.8 times T. And therefore the time taken to reach half that maximum height excuse me the time taken to reach its maximum height after that second bounce is then 0 0.4898 seconds so we know that that is this time over here where it is obviously going to take twice as long to return to the ground but then we need to realize that this question is asked for this time t it hasn't asked how long it takes to return to the ground so what we need to do is we need to add this value the amount of time it takes to return to the ground after its second bounce to the amount of time it took to reach its second bounce and therefore our final answer for the time delta t is equal to 1.97 plus two times this time that we have calculated here, 0 0.4895, excuse me, 98. And so our final answer is then 2.96 seconds. Again, we have done this because we said that we need to calculate this amount of time, the amount of time it takes to get from the ground to its maximum height. I have then doubled that because it will take equally long to get back down to time t, but time t started at 0 0.97 and therefore the total amount of time is the sum of 0 to 1.97 seconds plus the 0 0.4898 times 2. The way that a question like this would be marked, again, when there is a definition as given in the guidelines, the definitions are very strict and the guidelines require almost verbatim what is given. Question 3.2.1 asks us to use the graph to calculate the time. And what's important to see here is, although it is a very simple calculation, it is awarded or allocated with two marks. What that means is that they would like us to show some kind of calculation, and we cannot just simply jump straight to the answer, no matter how simple the calculation is. So always pay attention to the mark allocation, because the mark allocation does give an indication of what is required. Question 3.2.2, again, fairly similar in that it is also an easy-ish question or an easy calculation, but for two marks, meaning that they would like you to show some kind of calculation before arriving at the final answer. Important to note here that both of these questions, uh, just like any question in physical sciences, when there is a unit required, the answer is only correct if the correct unit is given. So in these two cases, the units given are seconds. Question 3.2.3, .3, calculate the speed at which the ball leaves after the first bounce. This is a fairly simple example of a formula substitution answer, where there is one mark awarded for using a formula as given in the formula sheet. Do not change the formula from how it's given in the formula sheet. There's one mark for correct substitution. Important to note here that correct substitution does imply that you show the correct sign. So when something is upward or downward, you need to explain why it's positive or negative. And that can simply be done with an indication that you have chosen downward as your positive direction. And then your final answer, final mark for the correct answer with the correct direction. In this case, they have asked for the speed, which means that they are not specifically looking for direction, but always a good idea to include that. And again, remember the correct units.
Again, all of these can be answered with any number of equations of motion, and either way, your answer, your marks would be given one mark for the equation, one mark for correct substitution, and one mark for your answer. Finally, question 3.2.4 asks to indicate the time t, and that's a six mark question. The reason for that is that it did require the use of two equations of motion, where you were given a mark for formula and substitution, and then you were given a mark once again for using another relevant equation of motion, finding your correct amount of time that the object took to return, the correct amount of time that the object took to return after its second bounce, and then the last mark allocated for explaining that you understand that you need to add the original 1.97 seconds so that you can find the time, final time for this question.